Hi everybody, welcome back to The Quest. In my previous video concerning thin and full keel boats, I gave you some of my views and we uh, said that we were going to discuss in more detail certain aspects um, surrounding those two kinds of uh, vessels. And so today we're going to get right into looking at the difference between light and um, heavy displacement hulls. In an effort to keep these videos somewhat short because they can get very uh, detailed and very technical, uh, I've decided to limit it to about five or six minutes. So we may have to break this one up into a couple of parts as well. But um, I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any comments or suggestions, um, if you have any uh, specific information about the topic that you would like to share with me and the rest of the viewing audience, please feel free to, to do so. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, we'd encourage you to do that. That way you can keep up with the various things that we're doing. Uh, you'll get notified of new content um, every time a new video comes out if you're a subscriber. So, uh, without further ado, let's get to the, um, the discussion of uh, heavy and light displacement hulls. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so in the early days of sailboat cruising, heavy displacement hull forms were the only choice for long distance offshore cruising. And that's principally because light materials for hulls and spars and rigging and you know, other fittings and equipment, they just, they just weren't available. So um, sailboats were just generally heavier. Um, if you know anyone who owned a sailboat or had any, or, or today owns a sailboat that was laid up back in the early 60s or uh, mid 60s, you'll, you'll oftentimes hear them refer to their hulls as bulletproof because they're usually a solid layup. There are no cord materials. And with solid fiberglass uh, of that thickness comes weight. So they were just generally heavier boats. Also, there was a lot more, there was a lot more um, underwater hull, which also um, added to the weight. But these days, you know, with the advent of exotic composite laminates and lightweight fittings, we find a lot of super strong and ultra light displacement hulls. And you can find those, you know, sailing all over the world today. But uh, for some of us, um, there's just something about the looks of a classic boat. I don't know, some, some people just like the new uh, pie-shaped boats, and some people just, are, you know, their eyes just go to these old boats. I'm one of those kind of guys. I really love the looks of, of the uh, classic Hans Christians and uh, West Sails. They're just beautiful boats. Um, and, and, you know, that's important, too, because, I mean, you have to love your boat, right? You have to like what you're, what you're getting into. Um, so, in, in some ways, those, those can be advantages uh, for the boat as well. Um, before we get any further into this video, um, I'd like to um, preface it by saying that this isn't, a, this isn't a look at stability or any of that. This is simply a look at the at, at three or four different hull forms and the, the advantages and the, and, the, and the disadvantages as I see them uh, from my point of view, from my perspective. Um, we will talk more about uh, topics that are related to stability when we start looking at things like the GZ curves and um, <clears throat> excuse me, boat displacement and sail area. Also, um, when we start looking at things like displacement length ratio, etc. So for now, uh, we're just going to talk about uh, some of the attributes of these various hull forms. So let's start with the heavy displacement hull. Uh, this would be considered an older style boat like I've been talking about, like your Hans Christians and your, and your uh, West Sails. You can see they have a, a full underwater uh, hull form that goes from the bow all the way to the rudder. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of surface area down there. Um, these kind of dis these kind of uh, hulls carry a carry a displacement length ratio of around 400, and as you can tell just by looking at the picture, they have a high wetted hull area, uh, and because of that high wetted hull area, they they're very uh, sluggish um, in light winds. In fact, in some cases, they won't they won't sail in light wind at, at all. Um, they are, however, uh, very sedate because of their weight. And they're very comfortable underway. Um, they're also, because of the hull symmetry, uh, they're also very well balanced at high angles of heel. 
And um, as one w w might guess, um, they have a very high load carrying capacity. <clears throat> now I heard, I have heard some people say, and I'm not going to mention any names here, but these are people that are supposed to be of some repute, say things like, uh, well, the only thing that's important uh, when you're looking at a boat is length of the water line. And heavy displacement boats really, um, they, they're not uh, capable of holding uh, any more uh, than any other boat. In fact, they may even be uh, less capable. And um, I can't believe that I heard things like this coming from the mouth of people who are supposed to be experienced. Uh, but to think that the only critical component uh, to look at in terms of safety, stability, um, sea kindliness, comfort, etc., for a sailboat would be length at the waterline is dangerous at best, uh, dangerous advice. Um, so I, I hope to dispel uh, rumors like that uh, over the course of these next few videos as we, as we look at these different hull forms and we talk about some of their advantages and disadvantages and we start looking at some of the math and the science behind, behind them. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of hull here. <laughs> um, and as you can see, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not intuitive, but uh, most of these boats uh, do not have bolt-on type keels. Those keels are integral to the hull. They're part of the actual hull. They pop out of the mold like that. And so the ballast for these boats is inside or encapsulated into the actual hull. Um, the advantage there is there are no hull bolts. Hull bolts. You don't have to worry about through bolting to your uh, your keel to your um, your keel bolts. I'm sorry. You don't have to worry about bolt bolting through the hull to hold your keel on. So there's no maintenance or uh, uh, worry about keel bolts rusting or breaking off and your keel falling off. Uh, so that's an advantage. Um, Apart from its contribution towards the boat's stability, the, I guess the, most ne the next most important factor of a keel is to resist leeway. Uh, unfortunately, because of the type of keel we have here, um, these low, aspect, uh, low ratio, uh, aspect ratio keels aren't very good at doing this. And um, uh, so that's a consideration. Um, to counteract hull drag in a boat like this, um, you, 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 because of all that uh, wet, wetted surface area, you got to carry more sail, and so enable the, to enable the boat to stand up, you got to have more ballast, uh, which is why long keelers uh, need to be heavy, and why they often are underpowered. So those are things to consider also. Um, I, I don't know um, how many people may have um, had an opportunity to sail one of these types of boats, but I will tell you that uh, if, you, if, you want, if you want to back one of these things up <laughs> under power, um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not much different than making up a paper airplane and trying to fly it backwards. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to do that, but uh, it's almost impossible. They're very, very difficult to back, and it's because of that, because of that hull form there, because of all that keel under there. Um, I would recommend anyone who buys uh, or is thinking about buying this type of keel, um, a boat with this type of keel, if it's a boat of any substantial length, I'd say 40 feet or bigger, you might want to consider a bow thruster. That will make your life a whole lot easier. <laughs> um, one, one of the other things uh, that we want to, uh, one, of the one of the other advantages I'd like to bring out, because we have been talking about some of the uh, negatives here, is that... Uh, when healed, because of the general symmetry, I may have mentioned this earlier, uh, of, the, of the immersed hull section, um, it, the, the boat will remain very, very well balanced at, at high angles of heel. The, the problem is that, that with these barn door proportions uh, of these rudders, and they're, not, they're unbalanced rudders, um, and they're often raked off the vertical, it makes them really heavy on the heel, uh, I mean, excuse me, on the helm at all times, really. I mean, pretty much all the time. 
So um, that's something to think about. Also, but they're but they're shallow draft and they're protected propeller and protected rudder. These boats uh, these boats will take the ground well, and they also um, have the advantage of being able to breeze over floating objects, ropes, nets, um, and without without problem. Um, and the high load cap uh, carrying capacity of these heavy displacement hulls uh, will be greatly appreciated by liveaboard sailors. Uh, which, uh, together with uh, their other attributes, will probably make them best suited for uh, those sailors uh, with the ambition, you know, to spend much of their time offshore in remote areas of the world. Um, but I mean, you know, if if for those of us that are more inclined to spend our time island hopping in the Caribbean or the Mediterranean, and cruising offshore in Europe and the U.S. Um, the sluggish performance of these uh, long keelers uh, may actually make them less attractive. But then that's you know that's where you uh, have to make a decision as to uh, what kind of hull form you're you're looking for. So that's that's the heavy displacement hull. We talked about some of the advantages and disadvantages. The next one I'd like to talk about is basically. Uh, a variation of the long keeler, uh, or known, also known as the medium displacement hull. Uh, medium displacement hull sailboats are basically a natural development of the he heavy displacement hull types. Uh, they have a moderate length thin keel, and they usually have a separate rudder, which is either uh, transom hung, or um, as you can see in this picture, uh, it's skeg hung. Um, now. On GRP boats, the fin keel uh, may be a part of the hull molding uh, and have its ballast encapsulated, much like the long keelers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, or uh, they could be bolted on, but in most cases, in this particular uh, uh, case, the medium displacement hull, they're generally still encapsulated, uh, which, in my in my view, is a uh, is an advantage uh, that's associated with this type of boat because. Uh, you know, you avoid um, the need for keel bolts and corrosion, security issues, uh, etc. You just avoid it altogether. These boats are still somewhat on the heavy side by modern standards, and their uh, displacement length ratio usually runs right around 300. Um, but uh, this this type of boat still remains a pretty firm favorite uh, with many many long distance uh, cruisers. Now, I'll tell you that you know this is no ocean greyhound, but because of the modifications, also the, a lot of times this uh, hull form is referred to as a modified full keel hull, and the reason for that is because you can tell if you look at the bow and you come down from the bow, you'll see that section in front of the fin where it looks like a bite has been taken out of it. Uh, that's been trimmed away in the, the, the in the in the forward part of the fin, and then of course that giant bite that's um, been taken out uh, prior to the skeg. Uh, by, by losing that particular, those particular portions of the hull, it really does um, increase maneuverability both under power and under sail. Um, you know, and, and while these are certainly not, they're no, they're no ocean greyhound, um, you'll see a pretty significant increase in, um, in performance with these, with these boats. <clears throat> Um, uh, for a given sail area, uh, displacement ratio, uh, their sail area uh, will be less than the heavy displacement type boats, which make them a little bit easier to handle for a smaller crew too, which is something to think about. And uh, directional stability and balance, well, that'll be dependent upon the quality of the design of the boat. Um, and but but there's but there's no reason why both why, why both shouldn't be excellent in, in this type of medium displacement hull. So I think that's about all we're going to have time for um, on this particular section of the, um, uh, of the video. Um, I'm going to cut it off here. We still have two more hull forms to, to look at, so um, we'll be discussing those in the next part. Uh, so that'll be part, um, part B, um, and we'll be going over both the light displacement hull, and I guess we'll go ahead and take a look at the ultra light displacement hull as well. Uh, I've enjoyed bringing this information to you. I hope it's uh, been um, uh, interesting, and I, and I hope uh, it's been informative. 
Um, if you have specific comments uh, that you'd like to make with regard to what we've discussed, if there's more information that you would like to provide, if you happen to know more about these, uh, you know, these particular hull types, if you have some experience with them, or if you have questions, please uh, don't hesitate to, um, uh, to leave a comment. Also, um, I'm going to put in the description um, section uh, of, the, um, of the posting um, the sources for the information that I've been providing so that you can go in and, and look at it for yourself and you can do some more in-depth research if you care to. So from the crew, from the crew of Thunder, we, we thank you for watching. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it and we hope that you'll subscribe. If you're not already a subscriber, please think about subscribing so that you can keep up with the content as it changes. We're wishing you fair winds in the following seas. Bye.